Imagine a world locked in eternal winter where colossal ice sheets carve the land and survival hangs on the edge of a flint blade. Long before our cities rose, before fire was tamed in hearts of stone, a resilient people roamed the vast, unforgiving expanses of prehistoric Eurasia. These were the Neanderthals, not brutish shadows of humanity, but masterful survivors who danced with the rhythms of a brutal earth. What if I told you their story isn't just bones in the dirt, but a mirror to our own fragile existence? Buckle in because we're diving deep into the mists of time, unraveling secrets that could rewrite how you see the dawn of humankind. Stay with me. This journey through ice and ingenuity will grip you till the final revelation. In the shadowed epics of prehistory, when the planet groaned under the weight of advancing glaciers, the Neanderthals emerged as enigmatic stewards of a frozen realm. Picture this, a landscape where woolly mammoths trumpeted across tundra plains, rivers froze into crystalline traps, and the sky itself seemed to press down with unrelenting cold. These ancient humans didn't just endure, they thrived, forging a legacy etched in stone and survival. But to truly grasp their world, we must strip away modern biases and immerse ourselves in the raw pulse of prehistoric life. Let's start at the very core of their being, their physical form, sculpted by the merciless hand of evolution. The Anderthals possessed a nasal cavity vast as a cavern, pulling frigid air forward like a natural furnace, warming and humidifying it before it reached their lungs. This wasn't mere coincidence. It was a lifeline in an era where temperatures plummeted to minus 20 degrees Celsius, turning breath into frost. Their barrel-shaped chests housed lungs that gulped oxygen greedily, fueling a metabolism that burned hotter to combat the chill. Robust limbs, shorter and stockier than ours, conserved heat efficiently, while their brains, larger in volume than modern humans, orchestrated a symphony of adaptation. But here's my take. This wasn't just biology at work. It was a profound dialogue with the environment. In prehistoric times, every trait was a negotiation with nature's fury. The Anderthals didn't conquer the land. They harmonized with it their bodies becoming extensions of the ice-bound world. Contrast this with today's humans, cocooned in climate-controlled bubbles. We've lost that intimate bond, that visceral attunement. What insights might we gain if we rediscovered such harmony? Perhaps in facing our own climate crises, we could learn from their silent resilience. These adaptations allowed Neanderthals to navigate the extremes of the Ice Age, from glacial maxima where sea levels dropped, exposing vast plains to brief interglacials where forests bloomed and temperatures soared. Their faces with prominent brow ridges and elongated skulls weren't deformities, but evolutionary masterpieces, tailored for a world of perpetual challenge. The internal nasal volume acted like a radiator, processing massive air flows to oxygenate blood and sustain energy in low oxygen environments. All archaic humans shared enlarged nasal features, but Neanderthals elevated it, pushing physiological boundaries to thrive where others might falter. In analyzing this, we see a species molded by selection pressures that favored endurance over speed. Their robust skeletons bore the marks of a life in motion, hunting, gathering, migrating, yet they carried the weight of adaptation gracefully. Prehistoric Eurasia was a mosaic of ecosystems, Tundra steppes in the north, dense woodlands during warmer spells, and coastal fringes where resources fluctuated with the tides. Neanderthal's physical prowess enabled them to exploit every niche, turning environmental adversity into opportunity. Venturing deeper into their toolkit of survival, the Neanderthals revolutionized existence with the Lavalois technique, a methodical art of stonecrafting that birthed razor-sharp flakes 
for spears and scrapers. Envision a Neanderthal artisan, hunched over a flint core in the dim light of a flickering fire, striking with precision born of generations. Using a bone or rock hammer, they chip away, creating points that could pierce the thick hide of a mammoth or slice through sinew for clothing. This innovation wasn't flashy, it was pragmatic, allowing them to hunt megafauna that provided sustenance and shelter in one fell swoop. Analyzing this further, the Lavalois method reveals a cognitive leap, foresight and planning. They weren't reacting impulsively, they anticipated needs, selecting raw materials from distant outcrops and refining them on the move. In prehistoric settings, this meant traversing vast, featureless steppes or navigating dense interglacial forests where rivers served as lifelines, guiding paths and luring prey to watering holes. At sites like the ancient riverbanks of Coors in northern France, evidence paints vivid scenes, Neanderthals ambushing aurochs and rhinos in soft mud where the beast's weight betrayed them. These hunts weren't solitary. They demanded coordination, a silent choreography of spears and strategy. My personal insight here, this level of planning underscores a social intelligence often overlooked. In a world without written maps or spoken directives as we know them, Neanderthals relied on shared knowledge, passed through gestures, grunts, or perhaps proto-language. Imagine the tension of a hunt, the rustle of wind through birch trees, the distant bellow of a herd. Success hinged on trust, on understanding one's kin as extensions of oneself. Today, in our hyper-connected yet isolated societies, we might envy that primal unity, where survival forged unbreakable bonds. The Lavawa's tools weren't limited to hunting. They facilitated butchering, hide preparation, and even woodworking during interglacials. Neanderthals sourced flint from quarries 20, 30 kilometers away, carrying toolkits that evolved en route, adapting to local needs without waste. This efficiency mirrored their nomadic lifestyle, where mobility was key to tracking seasonal resources. In colder phases, they targeted reindeer and horses on open plains. In warmer ones, deer and wild cattle in forested valleys. Their weapons, spears tipped with beveled points, transformed them into apex predators, capable of felling animals twice their size. As we roam through prehistoric Eurasia, let's anchor in specific locales that whisper tales of Neanderthal ingenuity. Take the rugged cliffs of what is now Jersey, once a promontory on the European mainland during low sea levels. At La Côte de saint Berlade, sediments stack like pages in a geological tome, chronicling 200,000 years of occupation. Here, Neanderthals perched on high granite outcrops scanning horizons for migrating herds. The view wasn't just scenic, it was strategic, a vantage for directing ambushes in the canyons below, where bathymetric surveys reveal submerged landscapes of traps and trails. In warmer interglacials, when forests cloaked the land and sea levels rose, Neanderthals adapted seamlessly. They followed streams through verdant thickets, harvesting flint from afar, journeys of 20 to 30 kilometers, toolkits dwindling as they went. This mobility speaks to a mental map of the world, a prehistoric GPS etched in memory. But why return to such sites repeatedly? Perhaps it was the pull of abundance. Mammoths driven into ravines, their bones piled in orderly heaps, not mere refuse, but monuments of efficiency. Skulls ringed the edges, ribs staked like fences, suggesting something beyond utility. Was this ritual, art, or simply a way to impose order on chaos? Delving into analysis, these bone structures challenge the stereotype of Neanderthals as primitive. In prehistoric times, building such features required collaboration, foresight, and perhaps a spark of creativity. Compare this to the enigmatic stalagmite rings in Brunichel Cave, deep underground in France's Aveyron Valley, 
constructed 175,000 years ago, far from daylight. Circles of broken stone, piled without apparent function, hint at social organization, maybe even symbolic thought. No tools for light? They must have carried fire, coordinating in darkness. This evokes a sense of wonder, a human urge to mark the world, even in hidden realms. In our era of digital ephemera, Neanderthals remind us of the power in tangible legacies. Further south, along the Rhone River, Grote Mandrin stands as a testament to nomadic rhythms. This cave sheltered Neanderthals for 80,000 years, layers of sediment recording fleeting visits, days or weeks at a time, with gaps of decades. Artifacts from distant lands, flint from 300 kilometers away, suggest networks of groups converging annually. These meetings weren't casual. They exchanged mates to avert inbreeding, maintaining genetic vitality in sparse populations of mere tens of thousands across Europe. Here's where the story pulses with life. Envision prehistoric gatherings under starlit skies, groups from east and west sharing kills, trading stones, and perhaps vocalizing in melodic cadences. Scientists debate their language, vocal tracks similar to ours, ear bones tuned for speech frequencies, yet possibly higher pitched voices. Not full syntax maybe, but musicality, songs and dances building trust for hunts. In my view, this proto-communication was emotional, binding clans in ways words alone can't. Neanderthals, with brains networked differently, elongated skulls housing vast neural landscapes, excelled in intuitive environmental cognition. They were wild in the best sense, empathetic, attuned to nature's whispers, far from the detached rationality we prize today. But culture? The evidence is tantalizing yet sparse. At Gorham's Cave in Gibraltar, intersecting lines etched in rock, dubbed a hashtag, stir debate, art or idol marks. No jewelry, no drilled beads like early Homo sapiens crafted. Skeptics argue Neanderthals lack the abstract flair, their world pragmatic over poetic. Yet those bone heaps and stalagmite constructs suggest otherwise, a desire to monumentalize, to leave imprints on the landscape. Reflecting personally, this divide highlights our anthropocentric lens. We project culture as paintings or symphonies, but in prehistoric purity, it might have been the rhythm of a hunt, the harmony of group survival. Neanderthal's art was lived, not displayed, structures born of necessity, infused with meaning. If they sang around fires, binding souls in melody, isn't that culture's essence? In analyzing their limitations, large brains but minimal innovation over millennia, we see a species trapped in success, excelling in stability but faltering against change. Neanderthals lived in small clans of 20 to 30 individuals, perhaps two or three families, roaming defined territories. These groups met at key sites for hunts, information exchange, and genetic refreshment, ensuring survival in a vast, sparsely populated continent. Their social intelligence shone in cooperative endeavors, from trapping prey in canyons to sharing resources during harsh winters. Now as glaciers retreated and interglacials bloomed, a shadow loomed, Homo sapiens, arriving around 50,000 years ago from African cradle lens. They swept through in waves, scouts first, wielding advanced tools, then settlers via river valleys like the Rhone. At Mandarin, flint shifts mark the transition. Neanderthals last holdouts overlapping with newcomers for millennia. Interbreeding occurred, Modern Europeans carry 1-2% Neanderthal DNA, gifting immune boosts and adaptations. But why extinction? Not genocide, but a mosaic fade. Small Neanderthal groups absorbed, outcompeted by sapiens innovation, diverse tools, symbolic art, larger networks. Climate flux played a role, but sapiens flexibility sealed the deal. This coexistence was a prehistoric crossroads where two humanities mingled, Neanderthals, masters of their niche, couldn't pivot fast enough. It echoes modern migrations, cultural shocks, blends, and losses. 
What if Neanderthals had innovated more? Their environmental attunement might have birthed a greener world. To make this vivid, let's weave in real-life parallels from history and today. Consider the Inuit of the Arctic, echoing Neanderthal cold adaptation with igloos and harpoons, surviving where others perish. Or the last Tasmanians, isolated for millennia, facing extinction upon European contact, not through violence alone, but cultural overwhelm. In 1803, when British settlers arrived, Tasmanian aboriginals numbered thousands. By 1876, the last full-blooded individual, Truganini, passed, their knowledge of fire-making and hunting vanishing like Neanderthal ways. Similarly, think of modern indigenous groups like the Yanomami and the Amazon, nomadic hunters attuned to forests now threatened by encroachment. Their seasonal migrations mirror Neanderthal circuits, exchanging goods at gatherings to sustain bloodlines. These stories humanize the prehistoric, Neanderthals weren't abstract fossils, but people like these, facing oblivion amid change. Or recall the 2010 discovery in Siberia's Denisova cave, where a finger bone revealed Denisovans, Neanderthal cousins, interbreeding with sapiens, much like the Rhone Valley encounters. A young girl's remains showed mixed heritage, a real-life tale of prehistoric romance or alliance, blending genes across divides. Such examples ground the ancient in the relatable. Survival's fragility, the beauty of hybrid vigor. As our epic unwinds, the lesson crystallizes. Neanderthals teach us humility in the face of nature. In a world of accelerating change, their story warns against complacency, adapt or fade. Embrace diversity, honor environmental bonds, and innovate with empathy. For in their echoes, we find not just history, but a blueprint for tomorrow. Thank you for journeying through time. May it inspire you to see the wild within.